they were not thinking. I like the way you put that. They weren't thinking. They didn't have their thinking cap on at all. In fact, if you go back to the record of Scripture and the biography that were provided of David and Solomon, guess what led to heartache, murder, division, apostasy? You can tie so much of it back to polygamy. Hello and welcome to Wisdom for the Heart, the Bible teaching ministry of Stephen Davey. Wisdom for the Heart is based on Stephen's pulpit ministry from the church he pastors in Cary, North Carolina. But from time to time, we like to do something different, and that's today. One of the things that we've done is set up a Bible question line where you, our listeners, can call in and ask any question that you have about the Bible or the Christian faith. That number is 910-808-9384. And you can use that number any time that you have a Bible question. We've received several questions from our listeners, and today Stephen is in the studio to answer those. Here's our first question. My name is Carla. I'm calling from Spring Branch, Texas. I have a question from Numbers 13, verse 33 where it talks about the giants that the spies had seen in the land of Canaan. And it says in parentheses in my version of New King James, the descendants of Anak came from the giants. What exactly is that referring to? What giants? Thank you for the truth that you give us of Scripture. God bless you. You know, Stephen, from time to time as people are reading the Bible, we come across words that we're unfamiliar with, or maybe even people like those that Carla is referring to that that no longer exist. And it can be confusing to figure out what the Bible is referring to. And it's true, Scott, and this is probably one of those uh, often repeated questions. What do we do with the Nephilim, the giants in the land and their relationship to Anak? And uh, of course, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 6, where we have that confusing passage about the sons of God intermarrying or, or mating with women. And it sounds like angels bred with women, and we, now we've got this race of uh, great giants. So if we just kind of peel this back and deal with some of these issues one at a time, maybe we can uh, come up with a, a good answer. First of all, Carla, thank you for your question. And she's asking a question from Numbers 13 and uh, verse 33. So if I could just go to that paragraph. Here, the spies go out, and and they spy out the land, and Caleb and Joshua, of course, come back with a positive report that says, let's go up against them. They're not too strong for us. And so they gave out to the sons of Israel this report. Well, there were spies who gave a negative report, and they said this. They gave a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying, verse 32 of Numbers 13, the land through which we've gone in spying it out, a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. The Nephilim is really unclear in its definition, but it it tracks back to the Latin translation by Jerome. This preceded, of course, the King James translation, and the Vulgate used the word gigantes to translate the Nephilim, and that's where we get the word or the idea of giants in Numbers 13. Now, the context of Genesis chapter 6 doesn't necessarily refer to giants, but I think it's safe to say that this is an unusual um, group of individuals that appear in several occasions in the Old Testament, and I think it's clear to say that they were, they were tall in size, they were, they were frankly giants in size. I think if we saw one of them today, we would be uh, rather impressed. I frankly saw a bunch of them playing recently on the weekend. You know, they're six foot seven inches tall, weighing 350 pounds. And uh, most conservative historians taking some of the measurements of the Old Testament say that there, there were men that would be about seven feet tall, 
very large in stature. The trouble I've got, and Carla, if I could just answer this little bit of it, I, I don't think that what we have in Genesis 6 is an angelic interbreeding, a fallen angel interbreeding with women. There are a lot of problems related to that. We would have to have spirit beings, not just taking the form of mankind, but able to reproduce. We have uh, then this sort of half angel, half human. Those that hold to that view would say, well, they were destroyed in the flood, and that may be one way to, to, to solve the problem. The bigger issue that I have is texts like Acts chapter 17, where we're told that all the nations are of one blood or one man. We don't have a combination of angelic blood and Adamic blood. So the Anakites, you know, in this view of the Nephilim, uh, you've got this problem. They would still be living. In fact, they'd still be breeding. You'd still have angelic DNA, so to speak, with human DNA. And I think it's clear from Acts 17 that no such thing exists. So what were these Nephilim? What are these Anakim? Well, if you go back to Genesis 6, I think the Bible is really clear. If you just take it in context, a lot of times we stop reading the Bible at one phrase and come up with all sorts of views. We're told in Genesis 6 it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And so, of course, people say, hey, the sons of God is a phrase used of angelic creatures, and yes, it is. So this means that it would be the fallen angelic beings that mated with women. The problem with that is you just need to keep reading. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Well, what does the next phrase say? These were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And then you're told uh, in the next few verses that Noah was a man who was a, who was a righteous man. He's talking about men, so I would have to agree with those conservative theologians that what he's talking about here is the godly line of Seth, not half a demon, half woman. And of course, mankind is fascinated and Hollywood is fascinated with the offspring of, of angelic or demonic beings with females. And uh, you get all of these uh, movies that are made and a lot of speculation about uh, half angel and half human. All right, now let's, let's jump from there to the issue of giants, period. Well, we know from Joshua chapter 11, well, even back in Numbers 13, the Anakites weren't completely wiped out by Joshua. Anakites weren't left in Israelite territory, but we're told that giants lived in Gaza and Gath and in Ashdod. The Bible never records their line ending, by the way, which means that if their line never ended, you'd have even today, mark this, you'd have today people on the planet with some demonic DNA in them and uh, human DNA. And that opens up a tremendous amount of uh, issues, obviously. Uh, if you have interbreeding. What you do have are, are tall men. You have uh, a tall race, and we, we have uh, people the same size today that would have matched the size of Goliath. You get up to about 6'9", six, 6'10", six, seven feet, and a large size, and you've got exactly what these Israelite spies saw in uh, the land. They're not the result of interbreeding. They are simply large human beings, the kinds of human beings we see playing basketball today and, and football. But if you go through the Old Testament, Carla, you can see references to the Rephaim, the most common term used to describe giants in the Bible, by the way. They're referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and Second Samuel 21. The Rephaim simply could be translated giants uh, as it is. Uh, you have the Nephilim, of course, we've referred to in Genesis chapter 6. We're told that they're very large, they're strong. You have the Anakim also mentioned. 
And then, of course, if I can wrap this up, Scott, I know we're spending a long time here, but you have Goliath. That's the Philistine slain by David. And by the way, if you study Goliath's life, you'll notice he came from Gath. That happened to be one of the three places where the Anakim remained. More than likely, Goliath was a descendant of the Anakim who mixed with the Philistine population. We're told in the Hebrew text that he was six cubits in a span. That would be nine feet, nine inches tall. By the time he put on his helmet, and uh, I've had a picture drawn of Goliath, Scott, as you know, and unrolled it to the congregation here at uh, Colonial, and David would have come up to his belt buckle. So he would have been an impressive creature. And by the way, there are four more Philistine giants that are often overlooked. They were relatives of Goliath, 2 Samuel chapter 21 tells us. And I I frankly think, uh, Carla, that the reason David picked up five stones is he was expecting not only to kill Goliath, but his four relatives, who more than likely were in the Philistine army. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. That's very interesting. When when we encounter a giant living today, it's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. But I guess back then there was this entire family or clan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, while you were talking, I was paying attention, but I was also on my computer. (laughs) <laughs> and I went to the uh, Guinness Book of World Records, and I learned that the tallest living human today is eight feet three inches tall, living hmm. in Turkey. Hmm. Interesting. You know, Scott, it's also interesting to look at the fossil record. Friends, I often go to Answers in Genesis as a good resource, and I'm, I'm also looking on my uh, laptop, Scott, and uh, the fossil records of some pretty amazing animals that would have been shocking to us. A fossil of a turtle has been found. It was 16 feet long, a worm 22 feet long, a crocodile 40 feet long, a spider up to a foot long that evidently ate birds, caught in eight birds. That's just, just incredible. A lot of times, you know, Scott, people will look at the Bible and say, oh, you know, it's just a, it's a bunch of baloney because they reference these giants, you know, in the land. And, and I say, you know, just hang on to your hat. First of all, if it's in the Bible, we're going to believe it. But it's interesting how archaeology has revealed to us that even animals that we would think of as very small, they found to be, uh, in, in the past, large. And, and consider, again, the length of life in the past. Here's Adam living over 900 years. And, and the change in the anatomical structure of, uh, of so many creatures and even the lifespan is something that we, we believe because the Bible records it, and uh, it's interesting that the fossil record reinforces it. Yeah, and back to the passage that Carla referenced on a, on a practical level, it just reinforces the faith of Joshua and Caleb. Yeah. Just regular-sized men, mm-hmm. they spy out a land filled with these giant people, but they want to go because they know God's given them that land. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Carla, for calling. We're really glad that you did. And before we move on to our next caller, I'd like to give you the number that she used to ask her question. That's 910 910- Eight zero eight nine three eight four. Now, I'll remind you that we don't answer that number. That number is only set up to record your question for us to play on a future broadcast. If you'd like to speak with us, you need to call our regular office number. But if you have a question regarding the Christian faith or the Bible that you'd like Stephen to answer, call 910-808-9384. Here's our next question. Hi, Stephen. This is Kevin from Deerfield Beach, South Florida, and here is my question. What was King David and King Solomon thinking when it was plain as day in Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, where Moses, on behalf of God, said for a king not to multiply wives? Okay, that's my question. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye. Well, Stephen... What in the world were they thinking? (laughs) Well, let me just say very clearly, Kevin, they were not thinking. I like the way you put that. They weren't thinking. They didn't have their thinking cap on at all. In fact, if you go back to the record of Scripture and the biography that were provided of David and Solomon, guess what led to heartache, murder, division, apostasy? You can tie so much of it back to polygamy. 
uh, David's uh, polygamous life led to the rape of one of his daughters, Tamar, by one of his sons, Tamar's half-brother. You have the murder of Tamar's brother by Absalom. You have uh, Solomon, and we're told clearly in 1 Kings 11 that his many wives turned away his heart from the Lord and to the worship of false gods. In fact, I was just reading uh, this morning how uh, Abraham and Sarah brought into their marriage a polygamous relationship, and uh, uh, Abraham knew Hagar, and because of that union, Hagar would have Ishmael. And I can trace, beloved, all of the unrest that has lasted to this very day in the Middle East to that union and to the bitter hatred, anger, and fighting between the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac. You know, Stephen, the fact that the Bible records historic facts for us about what kings and Abraham and these other men did isn't license or right. it doesn't mean that we can pursue those things. Certainly. The Bible records a lot of things, and it doesn't pass judgment on it. It just simply reports it. It records it. And uh, that isn't our marching orders. Just because the Bible records something doesn't mean the Bible approves something. And there's a vast difference between the two. So keep reading the Bible, friends. What does the Bible say about marriage? We have a lot of information. If you just keep reading the Bible all the way through the New Testament, you find there are passages that are clearly speaking against polygamous relationships. 1 Timothy 3, in fact, requires that a man who will be a leader in the church, he can only have one wife. He can be committed to one woman. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we're given uh, the singular form of a wife and husband throughout the passage as an illustration of how the church ought to operate in its views toward marriage. You have in Ephesians the, the mystery of Christ and his union with the church pictured by the union of one man and one woman. In fact, it's fascinating. You get to the New Testament uh, texts, and you have that wonderful statement in Matthew 19 where, and Mark chapter 10, where it talks about marriage between one man and one woman, and then it adds, as it was from the beginning, going all the way back, Adam was introduced by God to his wife, Eve, at the very beginning of time. And the best picture and model for today is for us to go back to the created order and to understand that all of the biographies where something is reported doesn't mean that we're not going to go out and uh, do it. Hey, look, the Bible recorded that Judas went out and hung himself. Does anybody want to think that the Bible wants us to do it just because it reported it? I don't think so. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Kevin, for your question. And thanks for thinking critically about what you read in the Bible. These things are all written for our instruction so that we can follow the good examples that we find and avoid the bad examples that we find in Scripture. Friends, the number that Kevin used to call in with his question was 910-808-9384. And you can call that number 24 hours a day and ask your Bible question of Stephen, just like this listener. I'm in southern Florida, and I am Robert Nathan Elyon. The question is, how are the New Testament letters delivered? And to where are they delivered? And to who are they delivered? We don't have any computer or any of this stuff. There's no Ezra there standing up reading it. So how is Paul's letter delivered from the Roman jail? Thank you so much, Robert, for calling in with your question. So, Stephen, how did the churches receive these letters? That's a great question, Robert, and uh, thank you for asking. Sometimes uh, we uh, don't know, and uh, sometimes we're given clear Scripture on it. We do know, for instance, uh, that Luke and uh, the book of Acts, written by Dr. Luke, both of those books, were reports given to Theophilus, so we're told that he wrote them and to whom he wrote them. Uh, we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 12, that a man by the name of Tychicus was sent by Paul to the, to the church in Ephesus, and he carried, more than likely, Colossians and Ephesians on that same journey from uh, Rome. We know, again, as another illustration, the book of Philippians was written by Paul in prison in Rome, and 
Uh, we know that while he was there, we're told that he received a financial gift from the church in Philippi, and that gift was delivered to him by a man named Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus, in turn, delivered Paul's thank you letter back to the Philippians. And the book of Philippians is really just a long, very gracious thank you letter. Another illustration could be the book of Romans. Uh, We uh, take as implication from chapter 16, verse 1, that Phoebe, who was commended in the letter, that would have been an, an oriental approach to commending the bearer of the letter. So more than likely, she was carrying the letter to the church in Rome. And by the way, keep in mind that Tertius actually wrote it, uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 22 tells us, as Paul dictated the letter. That may be of interest to you. Then again, probably one of the easiest ones would be uh, what we call the book of Philemon. That's a letter to a man named Philemon from Paul who tells him to receive Onesimus back as his brother, not as his slave. That letter, of course, being carried to Philemon by Onesimus. Let me recommend, in fact, not only to you, Robert, but to our listeners that you get included into your library a good Bible encyclopedia, a Bible dictionary. You can look up any book of the Bible, and and uh, you'll have typically at the beginning a reference to the origin, the author. Uh, it will give you information on how people receive the letter. We know many of these letters in the New Testament especially were circular letters. That is, they, they traveled from one assembly to the other. And I think a good uh, commentary or a good uh, Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia will help you uh, answer these kinds of questions. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And would it be safe to say that pretty much for every book of the New Testament, they were hand-delivered? Yeah, absolutely. And they would have been read immediately in the assembly by the elder, uh, the leader. Take, for instance, the letters of John. You have in Third John a letter where, where John is directly writing to this assembly through church leaders. In fact, he's telling them that when he arrives, he's going to deal with a church leader named Diotrephes, who was acting inappropriately. So these, these assemblies would gather, they would hear the letters written by the apostles. These would be their marching orders and uh, very significant moments in the life of the church. And then they would copy them down, and they would, of, of course, circulate them to uh, other churches until they had really gone around all of Asia Minor, all around the Western world, and uh, becoming ultimately, the record that we hold in our lap today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Robert, for calling in. Let me give you that number one more time that Robert used to ask his question. It's 910-808-9384, and you can call that number anytime. We have time for one more question today. Yes, my name is Charles, and I'm calling from West Point, Georgia. More false prophets have risen in the last 10 years than in any given period of time prior to that. In this day, men are trying to strip the Lord Jesus of his deity, demote him to the level of all men. I would like uh, the pastor to comment on uh, what's happening, mostly in our seminary schools. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Charles, for calling in. Stephen, I can't speak to the accuracy of his statistics regarding the rise of false teachers, but there certainly is a large number of false teachers, and many of them coming out of seminaries. Well, that is true. I I think that if you go all the way back to the beginning of human history, the very first person to represent God was a false prophet, and that was Satan who said, you know, God really didn't mean that. He didn't really mean to say what you think he said. So false prophecy, or or let's just say false representatives of truth, uh, began at the very beginning point of human history. And we we do know, and to his point, that it will increase. You know, 2 Peter tells us that in the last days, mockers are just going to sort of compound uh, one another. We're told in First John, we need to be very alert. If John believed that the church back 1,900 years ago needed to be alert in testing the spirits, that is, in testing the message of the prophets and those who represent God, certainly we should be critical in our thinking today. There is so much error. Frankly, you go to the Christian bookstores of our day, and half of it uh, isn't worth buying. 
There's so much mysticism, so much pietism, so much of it removed from the clear teaching and exposition of Scripture. There's a lot of stuff about the Bible, but not a lot of stuff actually teaching the Bible. And so, Charles, to your point, I think we need to be alert and careful today more than ever. So, Stephen, I'm, I'm guessing that this is probably part of the vision that you had in starting Shepherd's Theological Seminary, was this, I, this need for biblically grounded church leaders. Uh, absolutely. And, and one of the things we often say is we're surrounded by ministries today that illustrate with Scripture and expound on life, the human condition, human relationships. What we need are men who will expound on scriptures and illustrate with life. And, and one of the joys we have at Shepherd's Seminary is to have a growing student body of, of men and women, by the way, who are learning the scriptures. We believe that men should be trained to preach and to teach, uh, mixed audiences to lead, as First Timothy 3 clearly says, the church. We also believe women ought to be taught the scriptures as well so they can use it in their ministries to children and to uh, women's ministries. And we've got, a, we've got an exciting, growing student body, Scott, of, of men and women who are learning the scriptures and a, and a first-class faculty. And I know I've got to stop because you've gotten me started here and I can't go there. But friends, if you're interested, go to shepherds.edu and check it out for yourself. We're, we're interested in training men who go to the Word of God, preparing to teach the Word of God without any apology. If you're a pastor and you'd like to expand your theological training, or if you are interested in, in church ministry of any kind, visit shepherds.edu. Shepherds is a fully accredited graduate level seminary. And Stephen, in addition to his pulpit teaching ministry, is the president of Shepherd's Seminary as well. Well, friends, we're just about out of time for today. Before we close, let me give you that number that you can use to ask your question one last time. It's 910-808-9384, and we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to write to us, our address is Wisdom for the Heart. P.O. Box 37297, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27627. And our website, one more time, is wisdomonline.org. Wisdomonline.org. If you'd like to call us, our office number is 866-48-BIBLE. That's 866-48-BIBLE. And if you'd like to speak with us, that's the number that you need to use, 866-48-BIBLE. We'll be back on Monday with another lesson from God's Word. I hope that you'll make plans to join us right here on Wisdom for the Heart.